Okay, so maybe let's uh, start. So today we will continue talking about the uh, lower bound for reinforcement learning. So in the last lecture, well, let's just first recap a bit uh, what we have been talking about in the last lecture. In the last lecture, we talked about the general strategy to develop a lower bound is we can perform this reduction, where we will reduce the algorithm, uh, the lower bounds for any randomized algorithm. And uh, we need to construct a hard instance, which is specific to this uh, algorithm. And uh, expect a regret. This is the original target of uh, lower bounds. We're trying to prove uh, this is like small. Oh, this is uh, lower bounded by something. And we say by reduction, we can actually reduce it by some lower bound, which is to say, we no longer need to look at the randomized algorithm. We only need to look at deterministic algorithm. And uh, we can take expectation. And we are no longer look at problem specific, uh, like algorithm specific hard instance. But we are like uh, taking expectation of a problem instance over some distribution. So the important thing is uh, now we only need to deal with a deterministic algorithm, and uh, we deal with a distribution over hard instance. And in the last lecture, we're in the middle of trying to prove the lower bound for the multi arm bandit case, which is a, a simpler problem for reinforcement learning. So the theorem looks like follows. For any algorithm, for any algorithm A, there exists a multi arm bandit problem. So that the regret up to time t is lower bounded by some constant times square root of at. Okay, so this is the lower bound we're trying to prove, and we talk about some construction in the last lecture, where our construction is also very simple. It's a multi arm bandit problem, so we have eight different arms. We have arm one, uh, like arm two, till arm A, and till capital A, arm capital A. So we see the average reward or mean reward for each arm are all Bernoulli, the distribution are all Bernoulli. One half for the most of the arm, where there's only one special arm that. Uh, it's Bernoulli one half plus epsilon, and this special arm is uh, sampled uniformly random from all possible arm. So this gives uh, the construction of the, our distribution of hard problems, which essentially is a multi arm bending problem with one special arm. And uh, it's a w if, if, if the special arm is fixed, this is like a one multi arm problem, one hard instance. But we need to construct a distribution, so basically we, we make this special arm randomized through all possible arms. And I just want to recall, in the last lecture, we introduced a bunch of notation. We will continue to use it. We say uh, the expectation E star is basically taking expectation over all randomness.
including the random draw of, uh, of special arm. Okay. So including, including the random draw of special arm. And we have EA and E0. In the last lecture, we defined it to be EA. is defined to be the expectation taken over like random reward if A is a special arm. And E0 is uh, taking expectation over reward in a special case if there is no special arm. Okay. So it's like completely non-setting. And we also define a notation, which are R1 to T. That is a collection of all the information we will receive from multi arm bandit up to T round, which essentially the stochastic reward we're going to receive in the first iteration when we pull arm one, and the stochastic reward we're going to receive in the second iteration when we pull, uh, when we pull the second arm. Okay. Th 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 those are like the arm we pull at the first time, arm we pull at the second time. And then until time t, the stochastic re reward we receive uh, when we pull the arm at. Okay. Just briefly recap on the notation. And recall, this is like basically the full information we receive when we interact with a multi arm bandit problem. Because at each, each, each iteration in the multi arm bandit, we only pull one single arm, only observe the stochastic reward we get for that arm. So this is like uh, everything we receive from the environment up to time t. Okay. And in the very end of last lecture, we have been talking about uh, the first step where we computed the regret. We say this is equal to, we have been calculating this regret, and this regret is equal to epsilon times t minus 1 over a summation little a from 1 to capital A, where we're taking expectation of a, taking expectation where we, we when arm A is a special arm, and how many times the algorithm is going to pull arm A. So we, no, yeah, yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, do we stick to one arm for R1 to T? Do, do we, what, what? Uh, sorry? So we choose arm A and then sample from arm A, arm A from for two times? Is that what that means? Uh, sample A, choose this arm. So you, this what is what the meaning of R1 to T? R1 to T, oh. Yeah. This is, uh, I think uh, you can think this is like stochastic draw. So, so in, in the first round, we choose arm A1. Okay. And uh, we get a stochastic, stochastic draw of the random reward. So this is just uh, indicating like this is uh, like a stochastic thing we, we got in the round one. Okay. So at each, each different round. So even if, uh, let's just imagine, even if I always put the same arm. So my algorithm is stupid. I always put the same, same arm. I still get T random reward, okay. T independent random reward. So this is uh, indicating like uh, basically the round or the number of uh, episodes. Okay, so <coughs> for each round, we randomly choose one of the arms. Is, is that right? We don't randomly choose each arm. Uh, so this arm is like chosen by algorithm. So algorithm, for example, algorithm can be UCB or can be epsilon greedy. So they will look at the previous feedback which like uh, algorithm will, in the first iteration, pick A1 and got a reward of 1. And then the algorithm will process the feedback and uh, choose arm, choose the s second arm. And then you get a s second feedback. So you can think this is, can be a, a reward sequence you observe from UCB algorithm or from epsilon greedy algorithm or for any algorithm. OK. So arm is chosen by the algorithm. The, uh, yeah, arm is chosen by the algorithm, yes. So this is what I'm, what I'm saying is like, uh, for whatever algorithm, this is like complete history, like you observe from the environment. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question. OK, so we'll actually immediately use the fact. So we said the, when we look at the expression of the regret, the only thing kind of like non-trivial is this uh, expectation. That is, uh, under the scenario where arm A is a special arm, how many times this algorithm is going to pull arm A? So we say we will actually kind of bounding this term by comparing to E0, by comparing to the, like, uh, the, 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 the case, uh, vanilla case, where there is no special arm. So we look at this difference, Ea and A minus uh, E0 and A. 
So our whole idea is uh, basically when epsilon is very small, then whether A is a special arm or whether zero is a special arm, like it's a, it's a, whether there is no special arm, this is like very difficult to distinguish. So we expect for any algorithm, like you won't be able to spend a significant amount of time pulling an A. So we can actually do the expression that uh, this difference is actually equal to with summation over all the possible histories we're going to observe for the, for the algorithm. And because algorithm is fixed, so whenever I fix the history from R1 to T, then we will completely decide how many times I'm going to pull arm A. So we say the number of uh, times for pulling arm A This is for fixed algorithm. The number of times of pulling arm A is uh, completely decided. And this is a deterministic algorithm. Uh, by the history. Okay. So basically, by looking at the history, and now because we have a fixed deterministic algorithm, so we were always able to read from the history how many times we have poor RMA. And once we know this, then the remaining thing we just need to look at the probability of uh, observing this history. So the dif difference between under the, the case where A is a special arm, what is the probability I'm going to observe this kind of history R1 to RT? <coughs> and subtracted by P0, R1 to RT. Remember, this R1 to RT is just uh, a t-dimensional scalar, uh, t-dimensional vector, which, uh, which each coordinate is a scalar. So any questions about this? So basically, if the algorithm is fixed, by looking at just the reward, we kind of like know what algorithm we're going to pull next. And uh, this is going to be the reward of the next arm we pull. And we can basically recover the entire history of how, how this algorithm is pulling different arms, and what is the reward they're going to receive. Okay. So if no questions, I'm going to do another bound. Another thing is uh, now we have when we have this di expression, we can basically just upper bound this NA. That is, uh, whatever the trajectory is, I'm gonna number of time we're gonna pull arm A by T. Okay. So I'm just upper bounding this NA by T, and then we write the remaining thing, R1 to T, and we say the upper bound, which is uh, PA of R1 to T subtract P0. R one to T. 
And for those of you who, who learn like the probability, you will notice this is essentially the TV distance, total variation distance between this uh, probability and this probability. So it's 2 times t times the TV distance between p0, pa, and p0. TV is essentially just defined as one half of this uh, summation of the absolute difference on each each pro each map. Yes. Uh, I'm pretty confused. So, mm -hmm. what's the reason? So, why do we choose special term for this problem? So, why why does it uh, why, why, why what? Uh, why do we choose special, special arm? Yeah. So we want to make this problem hard. So we're s essentially saying, essentially we want to prove some regret, right? Regret lower bound. That is, we're saying for any algorithm, we need to suffer from some regret. Okay. And if we don't have any special arm, like every arm is one half, then we just we can just put any arm and we won't suffer any regret. And only because there is one special arm that is uh, greater than the remaining arm. So that best strategy is always pulling the special arm. But because I don't really know which arm is special arm, this epsilon is very small. And also it's a random arm, that this special arm is hiding among all arms. So that's why it's very difficult for me to figure out which, is, which one is the best arm. And, uh, if I don't put a special arm and put some other arm, I will suffer regret epsilon per round. So I just want to say this is actually hard. And that, that I will suffer epsilon for a very long time until I figure out some. Oh, so we don't know which arm is the best arm, and we just assume there is a, there is a special arm and trying to find some upper bound or lower bound. The algorithm is trying to find out uh, what is a special arm. You can see any multi-arm vanish, but, but implicitly they, they should, they should tr figure out what is special arm, like which, which one is the best arm, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions about this part, or feel confused? Yes. This one? The, 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 the this one? Yeah. yeah, this is this is just come from the definition. Yeah. Okay. So if you are happy with this, uh, now we, we do the next step. So next step we will just directly invoke someone some inequality from the probability theory. It's called Pink's curse inequality. So the important thing is uh, this uh, p a and p zero is is a probability over r one to r t, which is as a sequence, and we hope we can do some decomposition. And the TV distance is not very easy to decomposition. While k l and uh, k l divergence is much easier to do the to do the, the factorization. So for p square inequality, we know for any two probability p and q, we can actually say the TV distance between p and q. is upper bounded by square root 1 half of the KL divergence between P and Q. So that means this is uh, less or equal to square root of uh, less or equal to t times square root of uh, 2kl p 
zero over p a. So now we only need to look at this KL and KL divergence. Okay, so we continue with the KL divergence. First, by definition of KL divergence, KL is again a summation of all the possible R1 t to T sequence. And the definition of KL divergence is uh, P0 R1 to T times the log of uh, P0 R1 to T over PA R1 to T. Yes. What's the general definition of respect to Uh yeah, this is this is basically the general definition. It's a uh, it's like just the uh, summation of uh, px log px over qx. Uh, summation over for all x. This is like the definition of KL and which we just replace x by r1 to t here. So now we will use some structure for it. The first step, uh, we don't do anything for outside. But inside, for, the, for each probability of R1 to T, P0 R1 to T, and PA R1 to T, we we kind of like we, we factorize it. We, we say this, is, this probability of a joint probability of everything is equal to the product, product of a conditional probability. So this is equal to a product over t, t from 1 to capital T. The probability under this zero instance of the observing Rt condition uh, we observe previous R1 to t minus 1. This is like a very standard probability equality. And uh, for the denominator, it's also the same. It's a product from t, from little, little t from 1 to capital T, and PA, RT given R1 to t, t minus 1. For the next step, we notice we can move the product within the log outside to make it a summation. Okay. So the next step is just equal to summation over little t from 1 to capital T and a summation of r 1 to t p0 R1 to T log P0 R little t condition on the previous thing divided by PA R little t given by the previous thing. So all, all I did is just uh, make the product outside the log. So that becomes uh, the summation. <coughs> so another thing we notice is uh, we can essentially divide this summation to be two parts. One is I first summation from, uh, from t plus 1 to t. And then I summation from r1 to rt. Okay, so I can essentially summation over all possible 
like in a different order. And we notice the, the remaining part actually does not depend on this t plus 1 to capital T. So we can essentially also decompose this to be P0 R T plus 1 to capital T conditional R1 to T times uh, probability of R1 to T. And we say this summation we decompose into two parts. That is, we summation from R1 to T and the summation from RT plus 1 to capital T. And we notice this part actually sum to 1. So we can like simplify the, this expression, which is equal to summation little t from 1 to capital T and summation r from 1 to little t, p0 r from 1 to little t, log of the probability rt given r1 to t minus 1, and pa rt from r1 to t minus 1. And another thing I noti we notice uh, from this fact is uh, because we say r1 to t minus 1 is the complete history we observe from the environment uh, for this algorithm. So that means uh, for fixed algorithm, a t, the action the algorithm choose at time t, is completely determined by the history that r1 to t minus 1. Okay, So once we fix the history, we know what, al what this algorithm is going to make for uh, what, what action it's going to take at time step t. And also, we know if, uh, if somehow a t is not equal to a, is not equal to the special arm. This is like special arm. then we will have p0 rt given r1 to t minus 1 is equal to pa rt r1 to t minus 1. The reason is essentially when we condition on our previous history, we kind of like determine what is the arm. And when arm is not equal to a, we know this is not a special arm. If it's a non-special arm, then in the vanilla case P0, and in the case A is special arm, it doesn't really matter because I'm pulling a non-special arm. And uh, the, the reward is always going to be sampled from Bernoulli distribution with 1 half as a parameter. So in that case, this, this probability is exactly equal because I'm pulling a non-special arm. And in this case, we know <coughs> this, this thing will cancel because they're equal, they're equal to 1. So that means when we look at this expression, we only need to count those uh, history, summation from 1 to capital T. We only need to count summation over those history, r1 to little t, so that a t is precisely equal to a. So we only need to summation over those history that my algorithm will, at the time t, will pick, uh, pick the special arm. Otherwise, this log, log this log term will just be 0, and um, we, won't, we won't need to count those terms. And this is p0, r1 to t, 
log p0 rt given r1 to t and uh, p a as rt given r1 to t. Why is what? Or why is it equal? Yeah, why, why, why those two are equal? Yeah. Oh, because uh, if AT is not a special arm, it's not a special arm, then everything is Bernoulli one half, right? This is the probability of this and this are also Bernoulli one half. Both equal to one. Yeah, both equal to, uh, no, both equal to Bernoulli one half. Yeah, I think, I think when you take RT equal to one, RT equal to zero, both equal to one half, that's true. OK. So next step is uh, more or less quite straightforward. We copy the first thing, t from 1 to capital T. And we again decompose this summation for to, to be like the first with summation over rt from 1 to t minus 1. And we notice uh, the this, this selection where this condition where at is equal to a is already completely determined by history up to t minus 1. Okay? So that we summation over all the possible histories so that at is equal to a. And then we can pull this p0 outside r1 to t minus 1. So we notice this is t and this is t minus 1. So we also need to take a summation over the last step. That is, we need to summation over rt. And because RT is a Bernoulli distribution, so we know RT essentially only has two values, that is 0 or 1. And we look at the P0, RT, given R1 to T minus 1, and the log P0, RT, given R2, 1, T minus 1, and uh, PA, RT from 1 to t minus 1. So although we write a very complicated uh, like conditional dependency on this uh, r1 to t minus 1, but the most important thing is it already tells you I'm pulling a special arm. So in that case, uh, under p0, this is, a, uh, this is a, like a Bernoulli 1 half. Where under PA, because I'm putting special arm, this is like Bernoulli one half plus epsilon. So essentially, this is a, a KL divergence between Bernoulli one half and Bernoulli one half plus epsilon. So the next step is basically just t from zero to capital T, and uh, we can essentially first group this thing together. This is just equal to probability. Under 0, we take at is equal to a. And whatever remaining here is actually equal to the KL between Bernoulli 1 half versus like a Bernoulli 1 half plus epsilon. And you can plug in the value, and with the definition of KL divergence, you can compute what is this KL. And eventually, this is equal to. So this part, the summation t from 1 to capital T and p0 at, at equal to a, is actually equal to expectation under the 0, zero case. Um, what is the number of time we're going to pull arm a? And the KL divergence is equal to 1 half log 
1 over 1 minus 4 epsilon squared. Okay. I'm just doing the calculation for you, but you can go back to check the computation. This is exactly the KL divergence, and this is what we have here. Oops. this as well. Yes? So in the last test, so we define E0 and EA as uh, E0 for the expectation value if there is no special arm. There is no. A is for if action A is the special arm. Arms, special arm, mm -hmm. like that. Yes. Uh, does it also, it, can it be also applied for G0 and G0? Yeah, P0, P0 is exactly the same, same definition. Okay, P0 is uh, uh, the probability under the case that there's no special arm, yeah. while P is a special arm. Yeah. And for P is like um, there is a special arm. Like yeah, P is a special arm. And this is a probability because we, we, we actually pull the special arm. Okay. This is the like, condition on the history so that I will, exa I will always pull special arm A. At, at the wrong wrong T. So I kind of like select those history. So in that case, like uh, because I'm pulling a special arm, so that's why the, the PA is a Bernoulli one half plus epsilon in okay. that case. Yeah. Then like uh, P means one of the arm is a special arm. So there, yeah. there is one PA means A is special arm. The arm A is special arm. So we just recall how we get this, uh, like why, where we use this KL divergence. Like we, we essentially bound the KL divergence by this. So recall we use that KL divergence because originally we look at this difference, E A N A, subtract uh, E zero N A, and we say this is upper bounded by T times uh, square root of uh, two K L of uh, P zero over PA. So the other thing we can note, we notice is that we also have this summation of uh, A from, lit one, uh, from 1 to capital A. That is a summation over all action. We have E0 and A is equal to T. Okay. This is uh, basically saying the expected number Expected number of uh, times we're going to put arm A under the same environment, that is, no, no arm is special arm, is always equal to T. That is, uh, eventually, algorithm uh, in the T rounds can only pull T times in total. Okay. So the number of times we pull each arm sum together is always equal to T. This is for any algorithm. So this including some cheating algorithm, which we just always put some fixed arm. In that case, uh, my arm the number numbers like heavily favored for some special for for some arms, but uh, but the other arm essentially I, I never put them. So the summation is also equal to t. This indicates we can essentially summation the above equation for for all a. Okay. So what we have is summation over a from one to capital a. E A N A. Is less or equal to the summation of A from one to capital A, E zero N A plus T times summation over A again, capital A, 
square root of uh, 2 kl p0 over pa. Finally, I know we notice the first term is just equal to t, we already said. And the second term, we apply the previous bound we developed. And this is equal to t times uh, summation a from little one, uh, 1 to capital A, square root of e e0 na. log 1 over 1 minus 4 epsilon square. So the right hand side, we still have this uh, E0 NA here, and we want to get rid of that. And the way to do it is by Cauchy-Schwarz. Essentially, we can say the plus t, and then t times the square root. We can think this is a summation of a square root of this uh, e0 and a times 1. So we, by applying Cauchy-Schwarz, we, we move the summation inside, and we have the summation a from 1 to capital A, um, this e0 and a. times uh, summation a from 1 to capital A, 1, and eventually have the log 1 over 1 minus 4 epsilon square. Okay. So eventually, this is just equal to t plus t times square root of a t log 1 over 1 minus 4 epsilon square. So we're very close uh, to the final answer. So once we get this uh, NA bound, we, we now can look at our regret. Still recall that regret is, uh, we already calculated, is equal to epsilon times uh, t subtracted by 1 over a, summation a from 1 to capital A, uh, E A N A. And now we directly apply the bound. So we can move the t outside. So we know this is a greater or equal to epsilon t times 1 subtracted by 1 over a, because we also have a t here for this bound, and subtracted by square root of t over a log 1 over 1 minus 4 epsilon square. Okay. So we're already there. Um, we say this is uh, more or less uh, 
roughly if we look at order, we essentially have four, two terms. This one over A usually is like a much smaller. It's like a even smaller than one half. So when you, we'll compare one over A to one, it doesn't really matter. It's just some constant. So the first term is actually epsilon t, okay. roughly order of epsilon t up to some constant. And then the important thing is the second term. So the hope, hope is that we can use the second term to like uh, contribute to the, a big portion of uh, the 1 minus 1 over a and to make everything simple. So for the second term, we notice this is actually something extremely close to 1. This is extremely close to one, and the log when log extremely close to one, this uh, we can like we can take it out. This so this is roughly something like epsilon square, some constant times epsilon square, and up to some constant when epsilon is very small. So we can put it outside, and it becomes something epsilon times uh, t over a square root t over a. Okay, so up to some constant. This is uh, what do we have for, for two terms. The first term is uh, this, this two term together, because this one over it doesn't, doesn't ma matter much. And the second term is this term. Yes? Uh, because this is a one, right? Like one over a is uh, less than one half. So in the end, we just pick epsilon to maximize this lower bound. In which case, essentially, epsilon, we need to pick epsilon to be some c times square root of at for small epsilon, for small c. And in that case, we can, for some small c prime, in that case, we can see this again becomes some constant, like uh, epsilon square, a square root a over t and times square root t over a, and uh, some constant. So as long as we pick c prime to be something small, then this is like something constant but positive. Well, the word remains is uh, epsilon times t, which is just becomes square root a t. So this finished the proof. So the probability calculation is a little bit involved, but uh, the whole idea is uh, we look at this uh, difference between the, the like uh, vanilla case where there's no special arm versus uh, we have a special arm. And we essentially do an upper bound on this KL divergence. We say this probability, two distribution are, two probability distribution are very close. So, 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 so that because we choose epsilon to be very small, so that so that essentially, because the probability is very close, then, then there's not much information is leaking, even in this, uh, in this case where we do have some special alpha, do have some signal. So that is uh, why it's difficult for any algorithm. Yes? Yeah. Uh, we already said this is uh, like a square root, uh, this is square root of A over T. So that means uh, this thing is con constant, right? When we, when we plug it in here, there's a small constant. Uh, we can we can choose C prime to be some small small constant, so that this is one minus some small constant. This is again some small constant, S and so the whatever remains is outside where epsilon t epsilon t is just uh, square root a t.
So any questions up about uh, this one? Yes. Oh, it's, uh, it's, it's again like a, a quadratic thing, right? This is like a linear term. This is a quadratic term. So I think you can, you can make it, write it out. Epsilon t subtract c times epsilon square. Um, square root t over a. Something like, like that. And for the quadratic thing, I think the the optimal is uh, ch is chosen at two uh, b over a, right? Uh, I think optimal one is just chosen as a uh, like the coefficients, which which optimal one is just just this, roughly some constant of a over t. You can you can just do this square up. Is essentially like what is the right scaling of epsilon? Like where the right scaling of the noise make it very difficult for, for the problem to tell for, for any algorithm to tell, if if it, it can only interact with the problem with t iterations. Like you should you should basically scale it as square root of a over t. Okay. So finally, I think. Uh, we will also mention that uh, with similar techniques. So this is a regret bound. Uh, we can also essentially ask if we don't care about regret, we only care about the pack. That is the sample capacity to identify the best arm. What is the what is the lower bound? We can essentially use a similar proof. So with similar techniques, we can also prove a lower bound. on the sample complexity to identify the best arm. So the theorem is look like follows. Basically, we say for any algorithm A, that can adaptively pull for t times an output uh, a possibly random um, psi. So this is like uh, restricting the protocol of algorithm A. This is not restricting the power of algorithm, but it basically says algorithm A can only pull arm for t times and need to output a single arm because we output a possibly random single arm, but because we're doing like this best arm identification. And then there exists a multi arm bandit problem. So that we will have Ri star, which is a reward of the optimal arm, 
subtracted by expectation over internal randomness in the algorithm A, uh, psi. Essentially, it's the expected reward that we're going to receive uh, by pulling the arm output by the algorithm. We think this is a lower bounded by C times square root A over T. So this is a theorem. This essentially implies if we want to achieve, uh, if we want to achieve, make this epsilon, then that means we need a sample complexity that is uh, t is greater or equal to some constant times a over epsilon square. So we have to use this number of samples to identify the epsilon optimal arm. Essentially, you can think this is uh, something similar to the regret lower bound. This is like a sample complexity lower bound. I think in the in the class we kind of mentioned regret is uh, harder than sample complexity because regret needs to balance the exploration versus exploitation. Well, well, in sample complexity you don't need to you do, don't care about the uh, exploitation. Like you, you can just do pure exploration, and eventually find the optimal arm. Well, the lower bound is like on the reverse order. Lower bound is basically we want to prove some problem is hard. And we say the sum complexity is an easier problem, while regret is a harder problem. So that means uh, in, in the lower bound, proving regret as a lower bound is easier than proving the sum complexity lower bound. So, so that means the, the previous regret lower bound would not imply this lower bound, while this lower bound somehow can imply the previous regret lower bound. And so how to prove this, uh, we will actually leave it as a homework. Okay. So essentially, the argument is roughly very similar. It's a very good practice. You can just leverage uh, a lot of KL computation we have already done, <coughs> but make a slightly trick on the outside argument. Like we don't, we, we, we not look at the regret star. We look at some slightly different thing. So finally, after we're talking about the lower bound for the multi arm bandit, now we will move to the mark composition process. The reason we talk about lower bound for multi arm bandit because it's a special case. It's an easier case for, for multi arm bandit uh, for, for, for mark composition process. So now we will actually extend it how, how we extend it to the MDP. And if you still remember that in the MDP literature, we kind of we, we look at a bunch of algorithms, like UCBVI, Hofting, UCBVI, for instance. And uh, in terms of regret, the UCBVI is roughly order of uh, H cube SAT. Well, the Bernstein is uh, H square SAT. So essentially, this is a lower bound that we're trying to prove. We, at the, that time, we say UCBVI Bernstein is uh, is uh, optimal. So we say the lower bound. Is square root of H SAT. So up to log factor, it will exactly match the UCB VI. So this lower bound is slightly more involved, and we will probably not talk about it in this class. And we'll talk about an uh, alternative, uh, which kind of captures some of the essential idea of how we do the extension. So this, uh, this type of result is uh, so-called in a non-stationary setting. 
non-stationary setting means uh, P1 can may not be equal to P2, not necessarily equal to P2, and not necessarily equal to PT. Okay, so they can completely different. That is, uh, the transition at each step is different. So we can look at a simpler case, which is stationary case, where P1 need to be equal to P2, need to be equal to PT. So it turns out that in the stationary case, because the transition is easier, and we can essentially shave off everything by a square root of h factor. So we can have some modified algorithm achieve this h square SAT and this O tilde h SAT. And the lower bound is also square root of h SAT. So we'll talk about this lower bound. This is going to be the lower bound we talk about. So the theorem we're going to do is for any algorithm A, there exists A and D P with initialization S1 to K, K from little one to capital K, so that the expectation over A regret K that is defined as uh, summation K from little 1 to capital K, the value, optimal value at S1K, subtracted the value of the algorithm take at iteration K at S1K. This is lower bounded by C times square root of uh, HSA. So uh, everything is uh, very standard, like we for any algorithm, and there exists MDP. So this is like a standard of lower bound the kind of statement. The only thing like slightly different from what we have been previously talking about is this initialization. We are saying there exists some initialization, and uh, we remember in the upper bound for for simplicity and throughout this class we talk about for some fixed uh, for some fixed initialization. So it turns out upper bound also works for adversarial initialization. Okay, that's, a, that's actually a very easy adaptation. I haven't talked in the class, but, uh, but you can easily essentially use the same proof to say upper bound works for adversarial initialization. That is, suppose I have an adversary which just uh, tell me what is the initial state at, every at each episode. So to make our life slightly easier, we essentially say the lower bound, we also make it work, uh, we also state the lower bound for adversarial initialization. As I said, this is just uh, make our lower bound is a bit easier to prove. I think for, for fixed initialization, the lower bound construction need to be a little bit more complicated. 
I think the reason we can do this is, as I said, because in the upper bound, we can actually allow k different initializations. So, so lower bound, as long as we match the upper bound, that's fine. Because for lower bound, the harder the problem, the easier we prove the lower bound. Lower bound is trying to say the problem is harder. Yeah. Wait, so it's one different initialization per episode? Or? Yeah, you can, you can just pick whatever the okay. initialization adversarially. You jump to the start of the place. Yeah. OK. So with the multi bandit I already did uh, all the hard work uh, to proving this specialized setup lower bound is actually very straightforward now. So let's again consider the following um, distribution of hard problem. Yeah, what? Yeah, this is stationary. Sorry, this is stationary MDP. Of hard MDP. Okay, we start with the case uh, where we have three st states, and then it's, it's uh, very easy to extend to S states. Let's first uh, consider three states. So construction is uh, also very straightforward. So this is a three-state MDP. We have a zero state, one state, and two states. Where in zero state, I have one special arm that will transition to state one with probability one, one half plus epsilon. And all other action. will transition to state one with probability one half. And uh, similarly, starting from state zero, transition to state two, if I take the special action, that A star, we will have one half minus epsilon probability to transition to the next state. Where on the other hand, if we take any other actions, we will do one half. And a no reward associated with, with, with in, this, in this transition. No reward here. So the part, once we go to the state one and the state two, that's very straightforward. So state one is absorbing state. So whatever action you do, you always go back to state one. And state two is, again, is also absorbing. So whatever the action you take, you also go back there. And the only difference is uh, when you go to state one, every time you get reward one. And when you go to state two, all the all times you get a reward equal to zero. And this is stationary because this is a three state MDP where the transition is basically I give you here, and it's uh, this transition is the same for all steps. Any questions? Uh, what's the meaning of hard? Uh, hard means uh, this is the MDP we can prove lower bound. Essentially, the, we'll confuse that with, like, like essentially we can prove the, this lower bound. Okay. Or essentially, it's, this, is the, this is like a construction of MDP we can achieve this lower bound, we can think. And now we, we need to look at the distribution of hard MDP. This is like a single MDP. So distribution is, again, very simple. I just uh, sample a star, this, the special arm. 
is also uniformly from all actions. So because I can choose whatever the initial states is, uh, like adversarial is picking initial states. So in this case, I will just make initial states to be 0. And let's, let's see what happens in the first step. So what happens in the first step is uh, if we pick the special arm A, The transition we're going to say is uh, we're going to transition to state 1 with probability 1 half plus epsilon, and state 0, a state 2 with probability 1 half minus epsilon. And the cumulative reward we're going to get is actually just h minus 1 in a state 1 case, because for the all the remaining sta steps, I will gonna, I'm going to just uh, circle around the uh, state 1. I'm, I'm, it's an absorbing state, so I will never go out. This is like cumulative reward. And this is 0. And if we choose all other arms, we also again have the problem where state 1, state 2, 1 half, 1 half, and h minus 1, 0. So for those of you who kind of like already observed the pattern, this is precisely what we have for the hard instance for the multi arm bandit, with the only difference that uh, in the multi arm bandit, uh, the special arm is like a 0, 1. It's a Bernoulli 1 half plus epsilon. Now instead of a Bernoulli, like we, we get the reward that is h minus 1 instead of 1. So just uh, all the reward is scaling up by h minus 1. So basically the same hard instance as MAB, except uh, the, the reward of by h minus 1 factor. So in that sense, we can immediately prove the regret. Which is, again, directly affected by the scaling of reward is also scaled up by h minus 1 factor. So we know in the multi unbanded case, we know the regret is uh, some constant times uh, a k. Okay. k. t is like the multi unbanded In this case, like the number of episodes, which is k and uh, times the scaling, which is h minus 1. Okay. And this is equal to c prime times uh, h a t. Okay. Because we observe, uh, observe one of the h inside the, like we make t is equal to k, k h. I essentially proved the case for
where the number of states is small. And finally, for multiple state case, uh, it's also relatively straightforward that we just, uh, for S state, we kind of like a construct a S over 3? Yes. So how are you able to ignore the other two possible initial states? Oh, because I can adversarially choose the initial states. This is, so I just make fix the initial state to be 0 in that case. Okay. And the other ones will probably have lower parameters. There's no uh, Sorry? Or would the other ones have lower regret? Like they're not other one has, a low, has no, no regret, right? Because you, you cannot do anything. So for S states, we can essentially construct S over 3 copies of hollow instance of the hollow instance we just previously constructed with different special arm. Different means like those special arm are independently drawn from uniform distribution. Like uh, independent. Okay. So if S is not uh, mul 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 multiple of three, like you can just ignore the last one or two states. That that's also fine. Like just make it trivial, and you don't incur any regret there. That's that's also okay. So let's say if we have a three S over three harder instance, that essentially we have uh, something like this. Like four and uh, seven, like this. So what we will do is we will initialize at those states at each, and we call it each branch. Okay, this this we call a branch. Precisely k over s over three times. Essentially, we will just uniformly put all our episodes into into different branches. So we know each branch we occur the same regret. So we can easily compute the regret. of k is greater or equal to, I have uh, s over three branches. And for each branch, I am incurring the regret that is uh, h, a. And uh, because at each regret, each, 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 each branch, I no longer pull it for t steps. I only pull it for t over s over three steps. And uh, you can prove this is uh, roughly something c double prime of the square root of uh, HSAT. OK, and uh, finish the proof. So it seems the MDP construction is really straightforward. It's just uh, basically a bandit problem. I think this is a reason, this is because we kind of like, uh, essentially dealing with the easier case of the stationary setting. Where the non-stationary setting is a little bit more complicated than that, we, we, we can no longer just construct a bandit case. We need to construct something um, slightly non-trivial than that one. Uh, regret is a summation of uh, of each round, right? Summation of uh, every round, but uh, because each branch is uh, completely independent, so so you can essentially think of regret as a summation of the regret uh, occur incur in each branch. Yeah. 
I think the whole idea is uh, you can think you can use the intuitive idea we 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 talk about the, the in the last lecture and uh, this lecture the KL computation in the in the in the first part of the lecture is basically for rigorous informing theoretical argument on how we prove that kind of lower bounds and uh, but essentially we we developed this lower bound to match the upper bound to say the upper bound we developed is like sharp we should not look at any other algorithm can have better performance in the worst case. And uh, starting from next lecture, we will talk about the very last part of the tabular MDP, that is the offline scenario, where we, we, we no longer have like online access or simulator. Instead, we have some other people collect a bunch of data for, for, for me. And I'm going to reason what is optimal policy based on those offline data, which is uh, another setting and which is also frequently used in practice. And then we will go to the more advanced the function approximation, like uh, in the large space scenario where we no longer have like this finite number of states. And we'll talk about how we're going to handle those kind of settings. Yes. I have just a quick question. So we made like a hard problem that has this uh, regret. And then um, we couldn't make a significantly harder problem that has a higher regret lower bound because we know that there exists. There exists an upper bound. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, thank you. I guess we'll see you in uh, the week after. Thank you. Yeah. Also, happy sp spring break. <laughs>